turn in the book Christianity in the Hellenistic World to page 37. I want to spend about 10 minutes finishing up Plato and then uh, setting us up for a transition to the philosophy of Aristotle. Keep in mind that there is an enormous amount of good material in Plato that we are not going to be able to talk about. It grieves me that we're not going to be able to talk about Plato's ethics. There's a tremendous amount, there's some very, there's some, there are lots of worthwhile material to consider in Plato's ethics, but we just have to move along. We also don't have time to talk about Plato's political philosophy, his very important political philosophy spelled out in his book, The Republic. I hope someday that you'll take a look at some of these other things. I've placed some books on reserve in the library that can be very helpful in this regard. I think I mentioned them a week or two ago, but probably the most important thing you could spend your time reading right now would be Frederick Copleston's History of Philosophy, Volume 1. Uh, if you just want to know more about Plato or Aristotle or any of these other things, Copleston uh, is an excellent... Uh, Copleston's book is an excellent place to go. So, forgetting Plato's ethics, forgetting Plato's political philosophy, let's wrap up his metaphysics and his epistemology. And the first step I want to take in wrapping it up is to tell you that the best way to summarize Plato's philosophy is to present it as a form of dualism. Plato is a philosopher who seems to approach everything in terms of dualities, pairs, pairs of things. Now, there are three kinds of dualism that seem to characterize Plato's philosophy, and I talk about them on page 38 of Christianity in the Hellenistic World. We can talk about Plato's metaphysical dualism. We can talk about his epistemological dualism and we can talk about his anthropological dualism this is a nice way of wrapping up Plato I think Plato's metaphysical dualism is simply his distinction between the world of the forms and the world of particular things this is Plato's claim that human beings participate in two different worlds. The higher world of the forms, the lower world that constitutes this world of material objects. All right, so we have these two worlds. The world of forms and the world of particulars. The second type of dualism that we find in Plato can be called epistemological dualism. This is Plato's conviction that corresponding to these two different worlds must be two entirely different states of awareness. And so Plato tells us that the world of the forms can only be apprehended by the human mind, whereas the world of particular things is apprehended by our bodies, by our bodily senses. Okay? Now that's a kind of dualism. But the dualism goes one step further when Plato says that strictly speaking, knowledge, knowledge can only be applied to this mental apprehension of the world of the forms. Strictly speaking, for Plato, Knowledge must always have its object, knowledge must always have as its object these eternal, unchanging essences that exist in this higher world. I implied as much last week when I gave you my little analysis of rationalism and empiricism, and I set Plato in a category by himself. Plato believed that, strictly speaking, you and I can never have knowledge about anything that exists in this world. Knowledge is so wholly a word for Plato that it correctly describes 
uh, that mental state that we have uh, with of the forms. What we have, what we have of things in this object is something inferior to knowledge. Plato calls it opinion. Now, I don't want to start a, a, an argument with Plato here. Let me just say that most philosophers think that Plato is certainly on to something, but they're also willing to concede that he's a, lity, he's a little idiosyncratic here. He's, um, he's, uh, it's, it's probably not a wise move for Christian philosophers and thinkers to disparage uh, the world of bodies and to disparage uh, uh, the, the, sensory, the sensory information that we have about it. That brings me then to the third kind of dualism that we find in Plato's philosophy, anthropological dualism, and what Plato does here is this. He has divided reality into two parts. He has divided knowledge into two parts, well, knowledge and opinion. Now he divides a human being into two parts, and that gives us the body, which of course exists down here in the lower world, and the soul, which has as its natural home the higher world, the world of the forms. So there really is a kind of rhythm, there really is a kind of system here in Plato, and that's about as far as we're going to be able to take it. Now one of the nice advantages, I think, to understanding this, these three kinds of dualism in Plato is it gives us a foundation then to understand Aristotle. Just listen to me now and then we'll elaborate on this further later on. The major difference between Aristotle's philosophy and that of Plato's is this. Aristotle will reject every one of Plato's kinds of dualism. Aristotelianism rejects metaphysical dualism. When we get into Aristotle, in a few minutes we'll, we will learn that for Aristotle there is only one world. There aren't two worlds, there's only one. So Aristotle rejects the difference between the world of the forms and the world of particular things. However, parenthesis, Aristotle does not deny the existence of forms, he simply doesn't place them in a separate world from the world of particular things. Aristotle believes that forms exist, he just doesn't believe there is a separate world the way Plato did. Secondly, Aristotle rejects Plato's epistemological dualism. You see, if, there's, if there aren't two different worlds, you don't have to divide knowledge up as radically as Plato did. If there's only one world, as Aristotle will will uh, will tell us then we have to we need a new picture of human knowledge it's not as though there have to be two parts of us one struggling to understand the higher world and a different part of us understanding the lower world there's only one world and then finally Aristotle rejects Plato's anthropological dualism Aristotle denies that a human being is a composite of two radically different substances body and soul it turns out to be rather difficult to figure out exactly what Aristotle's view of a human being is, but this much is clear. Aristotle's view of the soul will be totally different from Plato's. In fact, I will suggest to you that when you understand Aristotle in a certain way, his view may be closer to, to the view of a human being that we find in the New Testament than Plato's is. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's no influence at all between Aristotle and the New Testament. None at all. But as we look around for various positions that approximate what we find in the Bible, I'm simply suggesting that Aristotle's view of a human being may be closer to what uh, New Testament Christians believe than Plato's radical dualism. One last point before we leave Plato for good, or at least for a time. Beginning on page 38 of Christianity in the Hellenistic World, I begin to discuss four unanswered questions in Plato's philosophy. 
I'm not going to take the time here to repeat everything that's in the book. I will simply invite you to pursue that yourself. Although I might suggest to you that I think this is important enough for me to ask some exam questions about it. In a sense, these four questions that Plato never answered help shape the history of philosophy for at least the next 1,000 years. Example. One unanswered question that Plato left behind was the relationship between, well, ambiguities in his view of God. I've already told you that there were at least two candidates for God in Plato's system. The demiurge, the craftsman of the Timaeus who creates the world, and the form of the good. Well, how do you, how do you relate these two beings? How do they fit together? Plato never did fit them together. It's kind of surprising to a lot of people to realize how sl sloppy Plato could be, how confused Plato could be, how uncertain he could be. This is a pretty important matter. Well, in the, in the subsequent history of philosophy, we're going to find some, some important consequences flowing from this. For example, in Middle Platonism, which doesn't mean anything to you now, in Philo, in Neoplatonism, the form of the good as God is going to play a very important role. Not only that, but this distinction between a supreme God, identifiable with the good, and an inferior or lesser God who may have created the world is going to end up playing a role in certain forms of Gnosticism. Some of the early Christian Gnostics and what that means is they were heretics who continued to regard themselves as Christians. So in some of the early Christian Gnostics, as opposed to being a Jewish Gnostic or a non-Jewish or non-Christian Gnostic, you'll find a distinction being made between uh, the good God, the God whom all Christian Gnostics should worship and seek to know, and a rather inferior, somewhat stupid deity, an inferior God who created the world. Now what the early Christian Gnostics, what some of them taught was that the Jehovah of the Old Testament, the, the, the Jehovah God of the Old Testament who created the world, was this rather inferior or stupid deity corresponding to Plato's demiurge who created the world. But you see, the good God, the true God, would never, con uh, would never corrupt himself through any contamination with matter at all. He certainly wouldn't create a physical universe. And so, well, uh, perhaps you'll see this if you study the chapters on Gnosticism. All of that has some linkage back to Plato's two deities. Uh, turn the page to page 40. Um, Another unresolved question is the uh, relationship between God and the world of the forms. This is page 40. In Plato, you find two contradictory theories. In some of Plato's writings, the forms are above God, and God, God must obey the forms. He is, sub he is subjected to the forms. They stipulate what God must do in some of Plato's writings. But in other cases, Plato's God, if that is the form of the good, Plato's God is above the forms. So what's going on here? Is God above the forms or is the world of the forms above God? Plato never answered that question. Well, we will very quickly learn about some later thinkers who solve this problem in a, in a brilliant way by locating Plato's world of the forms in the mind of God. The Middle Platonists did this. Philo, the Jewish philosopher, did this. St. Augustine did this. Plotinus did it. The forms are not above God, nor is God above the forms. The forms exist in the mind of God as his eternal thoughts. That's, a, that's one of the most important suggestions, moves in the history of philosophy, and it grows out of this ambiguity in Plato's thought. 
Well, you can quickly take a look at some of the other, uh, the other issues. Probably unanswered question number four is one that I will not expect you to understand. I do think uh, the first one or two of these are, however, important. Before we leave Plato for good, I think I should pause for just a moment and ask if any of you have any questions about chapter three in your book, which deals with the alleged relationships between Paul and Platonism. Did any of that stuff in chapter three cause you to lose any sleep, puzzle you at all? Here's your chance to put your question on the table if you, if you have any. The question, this is for the people on the... Let me tell you about the greatest lecture I ever gave at my state university. What a lecture. If there were, if there were a Pulitzer Prize for philosophy lectures, I would have gotten it that day. Everything, I had freedom, I had the vocabulary, I had the excitement. It was fantastic. Fifty-five minutes of brilliance. At the end of those 55 minutes, I was literally drained. I was perspiring. I was exhausted. But there was that exhilaration that knows that you've done something that no one else in the history of philosophy has probably done. So with about five minutes left in the class, I sort of draped myself over the lectern. And I said to the class with expectation, does anybody have any questions? And a little girl in the front row who had never asked a question before, never asked a question before, raised her hand and I thought, I've, I've, I've tuned someone into philosophy. And I said, yes, ma'am, what is your question? And it was this, will this material be on the exam? See? <laughs> now, the next time I tell that story, I can tell it in connection with you. <laughs> instead of that student. Um, no, there will be nothing from chapter three on the exam unless, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not, I have plenty of stuff that I can put on the exam. I don't have to pull it out of chapter three, but surely, now watch this, he's got to redeem, surely you'll agree that that's, reading that chapter was probably the most fruitful hour you've had in the last year or two, right? You bar none. <laughs> Good thing you said that. Um, well, no questions, that's fine. Uh, I hope you'll pay attention to that stuff because those mistakes that we try to correct in chapter 3 are so widespread, not only outside the Christian church from people who don't know what's in the New Testament, but also from people within the church as well. Okay. Oh, yes. It may not be chapter 3, but certainly in chapter 2. Does, does virtue and morality sort of mean the same thing? Like the question is, do the words virtue and morality mean the same thing for Plato? And the answer is no. The answer is no. For the Greeks, virtue, the word is arete, simply means excellence. And there are many kinds of non-moral excellence, all right? Daryl Strawberry, the Greeks would say, has virtue. I really don't know anything about Daryl Strawberry. But the Greeks would say he has virtue because he possesses excellence of a certain type. It may not be moral excellence, but it's certainly athletic excellence, all right? A dancer has excellence, a singer has excellence. So if you are, if you possess any kind of excellence at all, you are said to possess virtue of a certain kind. Now, of course, it's nice when, among the other excellences we possess, we also possess moral excellence. Aristotle, for example, and unfortunately we're not going to be able to say anything or much of anything about Aristotle's ethics, Aristotle distinguishes between moral virtue and intellectual virtue. Being smart is a kind of excellence that may or may not have anything to do with morality, okay? So what you would find in Plato is this. Cultivate your virtues, your moral and your non-moral virtues. 
But in addition to your non-moral virtues, don't ignore morality. Be just, be honorable, be courageous. Incidentally, if you want the best, if you want an excellent discussion of what we call the four cardinal virtues, which happen to be Plato's virtues, take a look at um, the second the second half of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, which has uh, several chapters on prudence, wisdom, courage, and temperance, or whatever name C.S. Lewis gives to them. Those happen to be Plato's primary moral virtues. And then, of course, C.S. Lewis goes on and gives chapters about the three theological virtues, which would be love, faith, and uh, faith, hope, and charity. Okay. Aristotle, let me tell you a little bit about his life. Aristotle was born three years after Plato founded his university. Aristotle was born in 384 BC. Even though his family had originally come from Greece, uh, by now the family had settled into Macedonia, uh, a territory north of Greece, then. And in fact, Aristotle's father was physician to the king of Macedonia. He was the court physician to King Philip. Now what this meant was that Aristotle's family had wealth, it had prestige, it had power, it had money. Hence when Aristotle reached his teens, his family decided that Aristotle should leave uh, Philippi, uh, the same Philippi that Paul visited, a city that received its name from king, the, the, the king of Macedonia, Philip. The family decided that Aristotle should study in Athens and at Plato's university called the Academy. So as a young teenager, Aristotle came to Athens. According to tradition, he was obviously and quickly recognized as Plato's uh, uh, most important and best student. Uh, when Plato died, Plato died in 347, Aristotle suspected that the leadership of the academy might pass to him. He had played the political games, he had demonstrated his philosophical prowess. Uh, he thought that he was entitled to take over the leadership of the academy. But unfortunately for Aristotle, Plato willed the academy to his nephew, uh, a man named Spusippus. And whether Aristotle was hurt, angered, or depressed by this, uh, uh, he, left, he took the change in good spirits and he simply decided that it was, that it was time for him to move on. Uh, uh, we don't know whether he was secretly jealous or depressed over this. It would, be, it would, it would not be surprising if he did this. Following the death of Plato, Aristotle wandered through the, uh, through the uh, Greek part of the world. He visited Southwest Asia Minor for a while there, uh, met the woman that he married. But in 342 BC, Aristotle got a call through a messenger. They didn't pick up the telephone then. Aristotle received a call from the king of Macedonia to return to his home and there tutor uh, the son of the king, whom some of you know is the man who turned out to be Alexander the Great. At this time, Alexander was 13 years old. Aristotle tutored him for one or two years. Uh, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that Aristotle was not the greatest student in the world. Nonetheless, there does seem to have developed between these two men a kind of attachment, a kind of fondness. We know that because years later, when Alexander and his army began conquering the world, he would often have his soldiers pick up new forms of plant or animal life, preserve them, put them in a bottle, and ship them back to his, his former teacher. Because, you must understand, Aristotle was not the typical otherworldly philosopher that we may have seen so far. Aristotle was a philosopher who was keenly, keenly interested 
in advancing the frontiers of scientific knowledge. He was interested in biology. He was interested in physics. He was interested in, in, um, in plant life. So there does seem to have been an interesting relationship between them. I have sometimes thought that Hollywood, well, not, uh, Hollywood doesn't make great movies anymore, but perhaps somebody could make a great movie called Alexander and Aristotle, or Aristotle and Alexander. Uh, uh, it, it no doubt would be uh, a fascinating, a fascinating story. Well, <clears throat> after Alexander and Aristotle went their separate ways, Aristotle to um, to gain control of Macedonia following uh, the assassination of his father, and then at the head of the Macedonian army, beginning the march that would lead him to conquer first Greece and then Turkey and then Palestine. Egypt, and then across uh, present-day Iraq and Iran and on, on the rest of his journeys, Aristotle, during these days, returned to Athens where he founded his own university. I don't have a date uh, to give you when Aristotle founded his university, but he called it the Lyceum. And... Um, it's, it's undoubtedly the case that what we today call the writings of Aristotle had their origin in his lectures to his students at the Lyceum. One of the reasons why Aristotle's writings are so boring today, and they really are, if any of you suffer from insomnia, forget the pills. Just buy a complete edition of Aristotle's works. Lay your head on a pillow put on some soft music, although I, c I can't find that in Orlando, and just open one of Aristotle's books. It could be something like The History of Elephants. That'll do it. <laughs> that, that'll do it. Or uh, his work on uh, astronomy, the physics. Just in 10 minutes, Aristotle knocks me out like that. 10 minutes. One of the reasons why Aristotle is so boring is because what you have in his writings are, for the most part, collections of lecture notes taken by his students. So, you know, <laughs> I've often wondered what kind of reputation I would have in the future if the only knowledge that future generations had of me depended upon my students' lecture notes. Well, and then some smart Alex says, well, Nash, it really isn't enhanced a great deal by your books either, you know. <laughs> but we'll, we'll forget that. Well, Aristotle, Alexander the Great, of course, as you know, died. He was not a popular man in Athens because he had conquered Athens and there had been some, uh, some serious problems in Athens due to the, to the Macedonian uh, 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 control over Athens. So that when Alexander the Great died in 323 B.C., Athens became an unhealthy place for former Macedonians to live. And there began to arise certain threats on Aristotle's life. Interestingly here, Aristotle found himself in a position not too different from that of Socrates. 80 or so years before. His life was in danger. Now, of course, as we know, Socrates demonstrated his courage and his bravery by refusing to flee from Athens. So it becomes relevant to ask, what did Aristotle do in the face of these threats to his own life? And the answer is simple. He skipped town. He got on the first boat ship out of Athens. But in order to prevent anyone from thinking that he did it because he was a coward, he came up with a great excuse. As the ship was leaving Athens, and he, as he was looking over the railing, he said to all who would listen, he said, I leave Athens lest the Athenians sin twice against philosophy. That's a great line. It wasn't because he was afraid of dying. He didn't want poor Athens besmirched by the fact that it had killed two great philosophers, you see. Well, it didn't buy him a great deal of time. He died probably of some form of painful
cancer, perhaps intestinal campus cancer. He died the following year in 322 B.C. Something ironic, something strange happened to his library. He willed his library, which would have included all of his own writings, to a, to a friend and follower named Theophrastus. You don't have to remember that name. And for some reason, Theophrastus decided that the best way to preserve and protect Aristotle's writings, especially given the climate, the dangerous climate in Athens, was to bury them in Asia Minor somewhere. And then he, he forgot where he buried them. <laughs> or if he didn't forget, he died. And uh, it, uh, there was a period of time when nobody apparently knew where Aristotle's library was written. They were buried in the, it was buried in the ground, subject to decay and corruption. And when it was finally rediscovered about 100 years later, it was in pretty bad shape. Fortunately, there was a group of dedicated scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, who took these manuscripts uh, and uh, worked on them and combined them with other of others of Aristotle's uh, sources that they had accumulated, and they began to work to produce a definitive edition or what was to become a kind of definitive edition of Aristotle's writings. I suppose the most important thing for us to remember in connection with Christianity is this. Aristotle's philosophy had no real influence during the first Christian century. That is, during the century when the New Testament was written, uh, nobody, with the exception of a few isolated scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, knew much of anything about Aristotle's philosophy. Platonism was rampant in the first century. Not only, uh, well, it was, ra it, it, was, it was rampant in various forms. It by then had become combined with Stoicism and Pythagoreanism and Philo's work and so on. But there is no, no chance at all of any of the New Testament writers in, uh, having any uh, personal acquaintance with the work of Aristotle. Well, Aristotle's philosophy. It's tough. It isn't easy. As you work through Gordon Clark's book, Thales to Dewey, there will be many, there will be many paragraphs and sentences in Thales to Dewey that will give you enormous difficulty. Don't let that bother you. Uh, believe me. Uh, we'll, uh, my major concern here is that you understand some of the major outline of Aristotle's philosophy, that you gain some familiarity with concepts in Aristotle's work that will become important in later, perhaps medieval thought, but there are lots of details, technical matters that uh, we're simply not going to burden you with. I do believe that um, uh, if, if you understand what I tell you here, then what you can add to that, what you can supplement uh, what you can supplement it with from Gordon Clark and maybe from some other things you read will be sufficient. Gordon Clark begins his discussion of Aristotle by talking about Aristotle's work on the law of non-contradiction. I think that's a good place for us to begin our own, uh, our own introduction to Aristotle. One of the reasons why it's important in a course like this is because the Christian faith is one of those uh, rare religions in the world that takes logic seriously. The Eastern religions do not. At least they do not in their most typical expressions. There are, as you know, uh, there, there are Christian cults and there are Jewish cults and there are Muslim cults well, you can find some Buddhist and Hindu cults that may, may profess to take something like the law of non-contradiction seriously. But for the most part, one of the distinguishing features of Oriental or Asian thought is the fact that contradictory propositions are often held uh, um, in some kind of harmony. There's, there's no recognition that if, if, propos if one proposition is true, then its contradictory must be false which it seems to me is one of the problems that Christian missionaries face. 
Because if you go to certain cultures in the world where the law of non-contradiction is not taken seriously and you don't know what's, and you don't know what's going on, you can present the claims of the gospel and think that people are accepting the claims of the gospel when in fact they're simply absorbing what you say is a missionary into some kind of non-logical mess where Jesus is simply added as another deity to a collection of deities that they've had before. See what I'm getting at? Now there's another reason why the law, a, a study of Aristotle on the law of non-contradiction is important. There are and have been far too many Christian thinkers who, who have tried to formulate a Christian theology that ignores logic. And so along these lines, I asked you to read chapters 9 and 10 in the book, The Word of God and the Mind of Man. Let's take a couple of these thinkers, just so that you see how important this is. I have a high regard for Fuller Theological Seminary. Fuller is today the second or third largest seminary in the world. The largest one is Southwest Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth. Fuller is either the second or the third. Uh, it, it, uh, it and Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky uh, fluctuate uh, in their second or third place. For too many years now, Fuller Theological Seminary has shown a distressing degree of sympathy for a theological system that really would, that really disdains logic, that really disdains the law of non-contradiction. When Fuller Seminary was founded in 1947, 48, the founding faculty saw one of their missions in life as combating the neo-orthodox theology of Karl Barth and Emil Brunner. Today, regrettably, Fuller Seminary is um, a place, and it grieves me to say this, but it is a place where the very neo-orthodox theology that was contemned by the founding faculty has now found a home. If you go to Fuller Theological Seminary and you're not very attentive to what you absorb from your faculty, you're very likely to come out of Fuller today as a Bardian, as neo-orthodox in some way or other. Now, one of the ways in which this neo-orthodoxy manifests itself among some of the faculty at Fuller, not all of them, I've had some of them assure me that they're dealing with this problem, but one of the ways it manifests itself is through the influence of a Scottish theologian named Thomas Torrance, former moderator of the Church of Scotland, former professor of theology at uh, the University of Edinburgh, Presbyterian, but a disciple of Karl Barth. Now in chapter, and I don't want to get into Thomas Torrance and all of that, you can read chapter 9 for yourself, but when you look at chapter 9 again, notice the strange things you find Thomas Torrance saying about logic. For example, he says, God's logic is different from our human logic. God, God reasons according to canons and standards of thought that are different from ours. And I suppose Thomas Torrance thinks that by distinguishing between the logic of God and the logic of human beings, he's exalting God but he isn't. What he's doing is turning uh, the God who speaks and shows himself, the God who reveals himself, to, to, to make a paraphrase on Carl Henry here, he turns the eminently knowable God of Christianity into an unknowable it. That's what Thomas Torrance does. We introduce an element of skepticism into the Christian faith by placing God above, above logic. Well, I won't pursue some of the other criticisms that, that chapter 9 raises against Thomas Torrance, but I, I, I just mentioned him and Fuller Seminary so that you'll realize that this is not a minor issue, this is not a minor problem. This kind of thinking, if it is thinking, this kind of thinking is pervasive in Protestant theology today and Roman Catholic theology today. 
And it's not pervasive only in Arminian or Pentecostal or charismatic centers. And none of this is intended to be the least bit critical of those movements. It's also present in schools that a lot of us still identify as evangelical. In fact, those of you who've read chapter 9 know by now that I have a complaint with the great Cornelius Van Til over this very issue that Westminster Theological Seminary and a lot of fine reform thinkers who have come out of Westminster Seminary and a lot of fine reform thinkers who, who, who have enormous respect for a great, a great man, Cornelius Van Til, have, I think, been misled on the important, the essential role that logic, that the law of non-contradiction needs, needs to play in our, in our understanding of the Christian faith. Well. Gordon Clark talks about the law of non-contradiction. If you've read, I think it's chapter 10 of, of the Word of God and the Mind of Man, much that I say in that chapter is really borrowed from Gordon Clark. It's influenced by him. So let, let's, just, uh, let's just introduce the question of the law of non-contradiction, and then when I see that reason has, is giving some of you a headache, then we'll take our break for a few minutes. What is the law of non-contradiction? It is the most basic of all laws of human thinking. But it is not only that. It is also a basic law of being. This is an important Clarkian theme, a theme in Gordon Clark. This is an important Aristotelian theme. The law of non-contradiction is more than just a law of thought. It is a law of being as well. But what is it? Well, there are different ways of summarizing the law of non-contradiction. We could, we could define it this way. The law of non-contradiction says that contrary properties cannot belong to the same thing we use the word thing because that's pretty ambiguous, to the same thing at the same time and, at the, uh, and in the same sense. Now, there's another way in which we could define the law of non-contradiction. We could simply say A, where A stands for anything whatsoever. A cannot be both B and non-B at the same time in the same sense. Some examples. A proposition, let that be our A, a proposition cannot be both true and false at the same time and in the same sense. It can't be. It's impossible. Or try this. Some physical object cannot be both square and round at the same time and in the same sense. There can be, not only is the idea of a square circle contradictory, the very existence of a square circle is impossible. You've heard of the search for the Holy Grail. In his next movie, I understand, Indiana Jones is going to look for the square circle. He ain't going to find it. It doesn't exist. There isn't a computer now or ever that will be able to draw a square circle. Not only are contradictory propositions, uh, 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 not only uh, must contradictory propositions be uh, irreconcilable, uh, the things that correspond to those contradictory propositions cannot possibly exist. 